morning, everyone. Good morning. I apologize for the late arrival of the refreshments this morning, but I hope you all got your coffee and cookies and we're ready to go again. I'm Joanne Bungie, and on behalf of the Community Education Council and our planning committee, I welcome you to the bucket courses this morning. We appreciate all 90 of you coming in this morning when it's such a beautiful morning outside. You will notice that we have pink sheets on your tables and chairs, and those are evaluation sheets for this bucket course. Uh, this isn't a requirement, of course. Nothing in the bucket courses is a requirement. But if you have comments or suggestions that you would like to make, this is your opportunity to do so. Either about this course or any of the bucket courses, uh, the bucket courses program in general, uh, please feel free to make your comments. And after class, you can leave them on the table or put them on the table in the hallway. Either way will be fine. Um, this morning, I would like to introduce Monique Shore, who is a library staff person who is connected with the Bucket Courses Planning Committee. And she has a wonderful project to tell you about this morning. Good morning. Quite a view from up here. I've not actually been on the platform yet. So. <laughs> um, I, I put out on their tables a little information sheet about the Powashi History Preservation Project. And um, this is a project that we are coordinating, uh, collaborating with the college library on to help collect information, stories, photos, documents that could be digitized and put in a searchable online database. So we are seeking folks like you who have, have memories of life in the area that would help put together, you know, kind of the big picture of what life in, in this region has been like over the years. So next week, at this same time and place, <laughs> um, we're doing an information meeting where uh, we will explain more about the project, the kinds of things that we're interested in, what the process will be like, and ways that you could get involved. And, and uh, I really hope that some of you will uh, come out and learn more about it. It's a very exciting project. It's a chance for you to um, have materials that you own that are from your own life, from the life of um, friends or family that, that, that were in this area. We're calling it Powashi County, but we don't necessarily like turn you away if you're across the county line. <laughs> so, um, but that's a lot of the things that we'll be addressing next week. But you don't lose your materials. You, may, you keep your materials and you go home with a scanned copy of it. So you can hand that a, a file on CD to, um, you know, to someone in your family who might be interested in it. So um, it's, a, we hope, a, a way that people can contribute your information to the history of this area without you having to give that up. So hopefully you'll come next week at 10 o'clock here and learn a little bit more about the project. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. That does sound like an exciting project. Uh, this is the last class of our last bucket course for the season, and we're happy to have George Drake uh, in for our fifth class for his four-class course. <laughs> Uh, and I've turned this over right away to Professor Emeritus of History, George Drake. Okay, it should be on, because the light says green. So, all it is, uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, persevering. Uh, with this course on leadership and crisis and um, welcome to you in the uh, personal audience and also those who uh, uh, if you've stuck with this uh, on the college website um, and that's I think as much of a feat as it is for you folks it's even more of a feat for people who aren't here and actually if they pursue, pursue this uh, online uh, we, we have, I'm actually going to recognize our guest <laughs> uh, from Southern California. I don't know if your sister's... Yeah, Vermont. Okay, Vermont. So, two, two absolutely the uh, brackets of our country. But uh, uh, Mrs. Osborne, her daughter Colleen is the uh, outgoing president of the Student Government Association at the college. And uh, 
our daughter Melanie and I last night heard her give her sort of, it was a kind of a State of the Union talk from the, uh, and it was really quite hard hitting. Uh, guess what? There is sexism at Grinnell College. Oh, and yeah, it, it's kind of hard to be a woman president of the student body. It's somewhat surprising, I think, to, to me. I'm, I'm at the college, but sort of floating on the surface, not really uh, in the in interstices. But it was quite uh, a stunning talk. And uh, anyway, welcome. Well, um, I will begin with a confession, which they always tell you you shouldn't do. But um, we'll not get very far with Mandela. Uh, even though <laughs> we expanded this from four to five, uh, I'm up to my old tricks of getting behind. Uh, though you do have a handout, which is a single sheet handout, uh, but with material on both sides. And let me uh, at least take a little time to explain the handout. And, and if we don't get to Mandela by the end, you'll at least be able to walk away with that and to uh, interpret it in, in a, some way. Uh, the, the one side is some apartheid law. And uh, that sort of lays out what Mandela and the African National Congress, the NC, was up against as they worked to overturn the apartheid government of South Africa. And you'll notice there's a pre-1948 and post-1948. Before 1948, segregation in South Africa was powerful, at least as powerful as Jim Crow segregation in this country but it had not been developed into a full-scale philosophy called apartheid. But as so often happened in elections following World War II, a dramatic change happened in South Africa in 1948, the election of 48. Interestingly enough, the persons who come into power, the National Party, had actually favored Adolf Hitler during World War II and very much opposed South Africans' participation with the British Empire in opposing Hitler. And some of the leaders have been imprisoned for their anti-war activities during that time. But they come out of that period with strength, particularly in the rural areas, and the um, electoral politics of South Africa were weighted in favor of the rural areas over the urban areas. And so in 1948, much to the surprise, as, as Mandela comments in his autobiography, uh, of many people, including the Western world, uh, the National Party was elected. Now, they're enough a part of the British system that they uh, don't want to act illegally, but they have enough power in the Parliament of South Africa to enact the legislation that they want. And so they proceed to enact very, I uh, mean, extraordinary legislation, the post-1948 elect. Uh, uh, legislation which, as you can see, attacks marriage and, and relations between groups uh, in order to try to uh, exacerbate and strengthen the segregation that already is in the society. And you end up in South Africa with four different categories. At the top are the whites. Next down are the Asians or Indians uh, represented as we saw with uh, Gandhi, and lots of Indians, particularly in the eastern part of South Africa. Next down are the colors, or mixed race people. And finally at the bottom are the Bantu, or the African or black population. And the notion that the National Party comes in with, and they have, they have deep religious conviction, I have to confess they're Calvinists, at least they're a version of Calvinism. Um, is that, so it's taking the Tower of Babel, the mixing uh, that happens in the Tower of Babel, and you get a Babel. After all, we look different. Did not God intend us to be different? And did not God intend each of our groups to live a separate life, a segregated life, and apartheid, apartheid is Afrikaans for a segregation. And so they proceed to enact a series of legislation that will preserve and enhance the separateness of peoples, uh, particularly not allowing any sort of intercourse between groups, because then you're going to get just a, a mongrel mix of population and are seeking a kind of purity. Uh, their 
their conviction is, is and they're undaunted in their conviction. And it, of course, as time unfolds, and in the World War II zeitgeist, as, as King refers to it, uh, it, the world is going in a different, different direction. Decolonization and greater integration of population, which was continued, obviously, up into our current time. So South Africa increasingly stands out as a lone bastion of segregation. And not on, they're not only de defensive about it, I mean they are defensive, but they're proclaiming. They are the only society that's on the right course. And they hold to that, as we know, into the 1990s, when they finally are forced, because of international pressure, internal pressures and so on, to yield to the pressures to uh, unfold, uh, 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 to, uh, well, destroy apartheid. So you have a series of acts here, and I won't go through them individually, but to try to give you this context for looking at that sheet, uh, which sort of culminates in educational uh, segregation. And for blacks, for example, Mandela had a pretty good education. He was educated by missionaries. He was a Methodist and went to Methodist mission schools. And he went to a series of them in primary school, middle Huxley school, high school, and then to Fort Hare University, which was the best university open to black students in South Africa. And a good deal of the people, a number of the people he works with in the ANC subsequently are at Fort Hare exactly when he was there in, in the 1940s. Uh, so there was a possibility for a black in South Africa to become well-educated. And, of course, the apartheid government wants to destroy that, so they do destroy it. And uh, they, they're, they're, they're unapologetic of saying, blacks have no prospect other than to be laborers, they should be educated to be laborers. That's sufficient. If you educate them above that standard, then they become unhappy. And we're really seeking the happiness of the black people, to be content to their little uh, constricted lives. But most um, dramatic in the apartheid was a very neat trick. They uh, proclaimed all of South Africa uh, the province of the whites. Their whites are 13% of the population. But they are South Africa. And the blacks are allowed to live there at the sufferance of the whites. So they create homeland. Tribal homelands, and there are a variety of tribes in South Africa, a variety of languages, and a variety of tribal cultures. Would they not be happier living with their own kind in their own areas? Now, granted, the areas they're given are the worst areas of South Africa, the least productive. Uh, the whites take with what they want, and of course, we, what they returned to, when, when we got critical about, they said, "What did you do with the Native Americans?" Or you Americans, what would you do if you were outnumbered six to one by the blacks, but you had the power? Would you not create a society that would preserve your power? I mean, they have a lot of good, good comebacks to the U.S. and our, um, any sort of self-righteousness we would have towards South Africa. Um, anyway, that's what they do. Now, there's a teeny weeny problem with that. They need black labor. And they need black labor in the cities where the industries are. So they allow the blacks to leave their territory, their homelands, and come into the white areas, but to, in order to be there, they must have a passport, a visa, a card, a registration card. And you could not live as a black in a white area without your card, the pass system as, as we know it. And so, and a lot of effort goes into enforcing that pass system because the uh, blacks who are there as laborers are there as aliens, temporarily, until such time as things develop that the whites can provide their own labor or whatever. I mean, they never quite figured out how they were going to get to that point when they could live without black people. But they, throughout the history of apartheid, they had to depend very heavily on blacks. But they made them aliens in their own land. Um, so. Anyway, that, a, a lot of these laws uh, uh, surround that. And by the way, there, is, <laughs> there are a couple of typos in here. I, I've used this a lot. It's amazing how long I've gone. It shows how careless I am without uh, 
correcting the typos, but under the Manual Education Act, and uh, essentially, I guess, the third to the last line, it says university strictly educated. I mean, segregated. Segregated should be that. And then there's a W lack, lack absent with were, and the 1961 past laws were extended to Af African women. So that, that's, that's a correction. All right, now, uh, on the back uh, is the Freedom Charter, which the ANC put together and had a mass outdoor meeting where it was passed. At the time that Mandela uh, was, he, he was there, but he was a banned person. And under banning in South Africa, you could not be with more than five or six people in any one place. Well, there were thousands of people there. So he actually described it standing up on a hill, sort of away from things, observing it from a distance. So he was not directly involved uh, in, in the passing of the Freedom Charter. But it, it becomes the manifesto of the uh, African National Congress and the sort of the policy document that they carried forward in their struggle against the apartheid government. And a parti uh, particular interest, without going into it in any detail, uh, the page 175, this comes out of uh, uh, Mandela's 600-page autobiography, which is an excellent, excellent book. Uh, the people shall share in the country's wealth, and then the land shall be shared among those who work it. Uh, this document is used by the apartheid government to label ANC a communist organization. And you can see, I mean, it, it's, it's questionable. For example, the national wealth of the country, the heritage of South Africans, shall be restored to the people. The mineral wealth, and South Africa has a lot of minerals, particularly gold, beneath the soil, the banks and monopoly industries shall be transferred to the ownership of the people as a whole. Is that socialism or not? Uh, Mandela will consistently claim it's not. In fact, when he became president of South Africa, the, the Davos, Switzerland uh, yearly meeting of, uh, what, I want to get tre treasury offices of the, of the plus bankers and so on internationally, he finally is persuaded that South Africa will not get the international investment it needs if it pursues this policy. And they move pretty strictly, fairly early after 1994 in the direction of capitalism, which is the direction of South Africa today. But they, 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 as you can see, there's a suppression of Com Communism Act that in 1953, I think it is, that's passed by the government. And they use that to label, uh, I mean, you're going to suppress communism. And they label uh, any organization that can be remotely attach to communism as a communist organization. And here they have, you know, document evidence that ANC is a communist organization. And it's partly that that they use to, to uh, eventually outlaw the ANC. So it has to go underground completely. And then the land distribution, re restrictions of land ownership on racial basis shall be ended. And all the land redivided amongst those who work it to banish famine and land hunger, redistribution of land. Uh, again, this is not something that South Africa has done, but was part of their uh, manifesto. And that it's interesting to compare this to the um, Constitution of South Africa today and uh, to their Bill of Rights. Their Bill of Rights is 12 pages long. Ours is, what, one page? There is so much, if they were a litigious society, that they would be tied up, of course, all the time today, because there are all sorts of statements about equality of sexes, equality of economic opportunity, equality of education, which they're not delivering. Uh, and you could charge the government for failure to adhere to its own uh, bill of rights. So anyway, uh, but this sort of prefigures the modern day constitution of South Africa. All right, well, as I, you could, we could talk a lot about Mandela, but we're here really today to talk about Martin Luther King, and so I will start to do that. Uh, the quotations you have, the handout that I gave last week, come out of this very thick book, which is A Testament of Hope by uh, James uh, Washington, who's a uh, church historian at Union Theological Seminary, and it's pretty much the, hope, the compendium of Martin Luther King's speeches and writings. Now, if uh, in the course that I teach, uh, we take, take just selections from it, but it's not hard with King, as I think I've indicated before, to pick out 
selections and not do it all because there's a lot of repetition. And uh, for example, the I Have a Dream speech which you have, uh, you can find elements of that all over Martin Luther King, including the speech that he gave at Cornell in 1968. So he quotes himself a lot, but that's not a bad thing because he's a pretty good speaker or writer to quote. And one of the reasons that we'll spend time uh, with, the, with the King materials today, and one of the reasons to do so is the importance of his use of language. Uh, two of the American leaders we've looked at in this course, Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King, are absolutely stunningly craftspersons of the English language, in my opinion. And I, I think that I'm, not, I'm not the only one who, who thinks that. Uh, and it, it's interesting, the comparison, we've talked about Lincoln with less than one year of formal education. With Martin Luther King, we have the person of the five individuals in this course who has the most education of all. Uh, in the first place, he is the son of a major force in the African American, the black a Baptist church in the South, Daddy King, uh, Martin Luther King Sr. And who is the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, a very large 5,000-member uh, congregation in Atlanta. And King, after his brief stint at Dexter uh, Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, then switches to his father's church as a sort of associate pastor to the degree that he's a pastor. He works uh, in his father's church and, and settles down in Atlanta, but mostly he's becoming obviously a leader of the American Civil Rights Movement, giving hundreds of lectures a year around the country as well as leading the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In education, though, we went, he was a graduate of 1948 of uh, Morehouse College. I had an experience when I was president of Grinnell at Morehouse. Uh, Don Stewart uh, was the president of Morehouse's sister college, the women's college in Atlanta, and we were thinking that, that we could m make a relationship with those two institutions in Atlanta and uh, have an exchange relationship, et cetera. We were so struggling in the 1980s to increase African-American students at Grinnell and to enhance the experience of Grinnell College with other students uh, in Southern uh, situations. So we did uh, create a, an exchange with Spelman College, which is the women's college, but it never worked out with, with Morehouse. But we, uh, Wally Walker and I spent about two days on the Morehouse campus, and that was an interesting experience. In the first place, it was a time warp step back into a collegiate situation of the 1950s. Very structured, very authoritarian, very obedient students. I mean, and remember, we're doing coming out of the 60s and 70s uh, at, at colleges like Grinnell. Um, in fact, we went to a convocation and the president at Morehouse mentioned that we were on campus. And everyone after said, oh, the president mentioned you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. You got mentioned by the president. I don't think that would have happened. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, as it turned out, uh, the president had been uh, the mentor of a student who had come to Grinnell as an exchange student in the 1940s and had then remained at Grinnell and not returned. So his notion was we were there to poach their best students, so there wasn't a chance. We, did, we didn't know that history until we got there, but there wasn't a chance. But to be a Morehouse man, in the African American community was, it meant a lot. The pinnacle of higher education for an African American man was to be a Morehouse man. Highly selective, powerful liberal arts college. Not a big, not a big one, but a selective uh, liberal arts college. And that was the college that Martin Luther King attended and, and where he succeeded. Then he went on to Crozer Seminary in Pennsylvania, which is a American Baptist Seminary, or Northern Baptist Seminary. So he's, he's educated in a very different environment intellectually than he would have had in a Southern Baptist. And I, that's, that's a terrible pejorative thing to say. But it, it's in the sense that everything is open to question in a seminary like that. I went to seminary in about the same period. I was about five years after King in my cycling through Chicago Theological Seminary. And uh, 
that the, the references King makes theologically are so familiar to me. And I went to a very liberal uh, Protestant seminary. And Crozier was also very liberal. And, sent, and li by liberal, I mean you're willing to say scripture is an historical document created by people. Uh, it isn't inerrant. It's, all, it's full of cultural references, cultural influences. It's to be interpreted that way. It's important, but not the word of God in, in any sort of liberal sense. You have to have the right, sort of the, the notion that they bring is you, you are, that the Holy Spirit is active, was active with the authors of the, of the scripture, active with you as you read it, and somehow out of that melange comes an understanding. But admitting that people will have different understandings of, of scripture. That's the kind of education that he had. And then he went on to Boston University to get his PhD in Biblical Theology. Uh, and he did so, did so successfully. And at the point that he finished his coursework, not quite finished with his dissertation, he then goes into the market looking for a job. And he's, uh, in his autobiography, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, he has a lot to say about his state of mind at that time. His, his, his idea was, I should, I, I'm a Christian, I've been theologically trained, I should work in the church. So for a while, I will take a pulpit. And then I'm going to teach in a college and become a college teacher of theology. That was his, his goal as he uh, is a candidate for the pulpit at uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, it's interesting that the call that comes to him, it takes a while, and he's traveling, traveling around looking at other opportunities, but he is called uh, to that pastorate and he accepts it. And everything changes in his life. Uh, as, it, as it happens, a few months after his arrival, Rosa Parks <laughs> refuses to leave her seat in the bus and go to the back. And so uh, the black Negro community, as it's described at that time, reacts. Uh, she's a well-respected member of the community. Uh, from the point of view of the whites, she figures she's an N N NAACP plant that was all orchestrated. It almost certainly wasn't. But there's a response. Now, what's really important to keep in mind here with respect to the American Civil Rights Movement is the importance of, importance of the churches. After all, if you're a black in Jim Crow South, how much freedom do you have to be hither or yon, uh, to do this or to do that? Your entire life is constricted by law and by custom. But your church life is, is your own. Not much restriction there. Uh, the black church, particularly Methodists and Baptists, function uh, pretty independent uh, within, obviously, the structure, but independent of white observation and white control. So the, the, the one organization you have which involves a lot of people and has a set organization on the ground, has meeting halls in which you can meet and discuss things and decide action, were the churches. So it's not unusual that the black pastors become leaders of the civil rights movement, particularly in these early phases. You really have Urban League, NAACP, which have been around for a long time, and which are essentially trying to work through legal patterns to uh, make changes in, in Jim Crow. Uh, and now there been, this, this new movement is going to be supported more strenuously by the churches, and the churches are going to become the new vanguard of the movement. And as so typically happened, we, and most of us in this room lived through that period, so we observed it day in and day out, uh, eventually that church group uh, gets labeled as very conservative, uh, and you have black power groups, Stokely Carmichael and so on, that rise and to the left. And ultimately King and his group end up in the middle between the Urban League and AACP approach and types of people, usually very well educated, very well established black people. Uh, the church groups, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference group in the middle, and then various groups with the black Muslims being the furthest, I guess, to the left or over uh, on the fringe, who are saying this society is totally corrupt, there's no way we can cooperate with it, it is, it is a representation of the devil and must be opposed. 
as that, and we're not going to be Christians, we're going to be Muslims, etc. So you, 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 you develop this whole uh, array of civil rights group, groups, and as so often happens, that person in the vanguard happened to Mandela too. Mandela begins to be labeled as terribly conservative, and the ANC very conservative by the Pan-African Congress people who don't want any association with whites and want to destroy white culture and drive the white man into the sea. That's not the ANC and Mandela approach. They say, we are all Africans, we can live together. So King and Mandela in that way end up being put positioned in the middle. The great um, opportunity to observe that is the uh, Meet the Press interview in the uh, mid-1960s where King is there with Floyd McKissick and Stokely Carmichael and so on on one side and, and uh, Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young from NAACP and Urban League are there and then there's King uh, and Pat, he had to leave, he was leading a demonstration in Chicago by this time the civil rights movement is moving to the northern cities as its focus and he had to leave uh, the, the interview midway through and after he left the whole interview fell apart uh, he was the one who was able to hold the two sides to some sort of standard of uh, civil behavior during this interview, but when he left, it, 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 it didn't, that did not continue. Well, um, I, I really want to go uh, back to the point of how important those black churches were. Uh, in, in the organization, the boycott, which lasted a little over a year, and which, and which the government of Montgomery, the, the uh, Secretary of the Jim Crow government, devises various techniques to try to stop it. They, the uh, uh, boycotters have developed a, a, a taxi service. How are you going to get people to work? They're, bo they're boycotting their main form of transportation. Well, individuals will take them. Well, then they uh, try out their laws that you have to have a license, a taxi license, to carry passengers. So you've got to stop that. People are walking. Uh, you know, it's it just they had to maneuver. It was, a, it was a series during that year, a series of maneuvers. The, the, the bus company and the government would maneuver here, and the, the boycotters would maneuver. John? I take it there was absolutely no cooperation between the black churches and the white churches in the South. <laughs> the, the question from John Knorr is, uh, he's, and Morris, semi-question, semi-statement, I take it there was no cooperation from the white churches in the South. We're going to look at that in the letter from a Birmingham jail. And essentially, they're, 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 the, one, one of the leaders of the, boy, of the boycott movement was a white pastor in Montgomery. I'm not sure how much he had his congregation with him, but he was one of the planners and leaders of, of the effort. But one, only one white pastor was involved. But I mean, they didn't do anything together uh, no. before the movement started. They didn't worship together, they didn't do no. food, food things together, yeah. nothing. Yeah, and the, his further comment is that, uh, uh, so my question is, that they weren't doing anything together. They were segregated. White churches here, black churches here, no common social efforts or anything. You're right, you're, you're correct about that. It was really just two separate oper operations, which uh, from the point of view of, of something like the bus boycott probably is a good thing because the blacks are able on their own without white interference to plan what they're going to do. And it was, it was a, 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 logistically a huge effort because they're de dealing with a population that really depended on those buses but it succeeds for over a year and they bring the bus company really to its knees because most of their ridership was blacks it was not getting any any revenue uh, so as a boycott it really does work but also uh, they get uh, there's a court case and then they get a civil right uh, a Supreme Court judgment that you cannot segregate public transportation. It's public. So you get the one of the, I mean, you, you've got, you've already got Brown versus the school board up to be Kansas. So you've got at least a legal statement uh, from the Supreme Court that uh, you cannot segregate and should not segregate, legally cannot segregate in education. Separate does not mean equal after a whole series of court cases that have reaffirmed separate and equal is okay. Separate separate can be equal, so, well, patently it was not equal, and the Supreme Court found against it in 1954, so uh, now you have a Supreme Court judgment that you cannot legally segregate public transportation, it's public, Why, how, how, how can you segregate it? So 
uh, it's going to take a long time, uh, and, and that's, I suppose, the point of time to talk about that, a long time for that to be enforced. You can get Supreme Court judgments uh, till the end of time, but then you have to enforce them. And you have to enforce them with governments that are devoted to segregation in the South. And ultimately, as we know, it takes federal intervention. So a lot in the subsequent years of the Civil Rights Movement is the effort to bring pressure first on Kennedy and then on Johnson. Uh, not only to pass new laws, like the Civil Rights Law and the Voting Rights Law, which are started under Kennedy and are actually passed by Johnson, and you could make a very, very, very good case that Kennedy probably couldn't have gotten passed. Johnson could, as a Southerner himself, and with his incredible ability to maneuver Congress. I mean, to, to those of us today, it's almost impossible to think of a president who can do anything with Congress. And Lyndon Johnson, probably more than any president in the history of our country, had the ability to play the politics of Congress to the hilt. He came out of it. He'd been majority leader of the Senate for years and years. He knew how it worked and he could, he could do it. So he gets those things too. But then you, you were, for an election, you were supposed to have monitors going in to monitor the election. The federal government's got to send them in. And the Johnson administration wasn't doing that very much. And King has a lot to say about that, the lack of enforcement of those laws. So a lot subsequently of King's work is, and, and of the Civil Rights Movement, is to bring pressure on the, the Kennedy and then the Johnson administration to actually do something. Uh, well, Eisenhower was involved in it as well in, in an earlier time. So anyway, that, um, that I go back to the point, without the black churches, it's hard to understand how this could happen. I mean, just, they're absolutely critical, and of course King was a black church leader. And he, his, his whole life has changed. He be, he, interestingly enough, he's elected to chair of this effort after having been there only a few months. So clearly he's got some charisma and leadership that is obvious to people. This young guy, just out of seminary, uh, who just arrived in town, and he becomes the, not, not only the titular, but the actual leader of the movement. And he knows how to work with older, more established pastors, older, more established congregations to get them involved. And this, it's a tremendous organizational effort. So King and his group were, were really quite successful in that. I'm going to stop here in just just a few minutes, but I, I want to just go on something I can say pretty quickly. He become they create this Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which he heads. It's the only time, essentially, he's ever head of an organization. That's his formal role as, as the president or chair. I forget exactly the title of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and he functions the rest of his life uh, as leader of that organization and as an associate pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. They, uh, he goes to India in 1959, the uh, bus boycotts in 1955, uh, in order to drink at the well of Gandhi. He's that closely connected to Gandhi and his movement's that closely connected to Gandhian principles. The five-point program of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and then I'm going to stop for a break, is to stimulate nonviolent direct action. Nonviolent direction. We're going to protest. We're going to disrupt. We're going to cause lots of problems, but there'll be no violence. And he, King had to work this as hard as Gandhi. He didn't always succeed in order to train people in the <clears throat> philosophy and actions of nonviolence. Disseminate creative techniques of the philosophy of nonviolence in workshops. So Southern Christian Leadership Conference will conduct workshops all over the South for people in the techniques of non and the philosophy of nonviolence. The vote to all citizens. Now I think every one of us in this room, well I, I'll speak for myself, but I think most of you would say that's almost the most critical factor. Think of what's happened as more and more blacks have been able to as the vote spreads out in our society so that every 21-year-old, as who is a citizen, can cast a ballot and will cast a ballot and not be discouraged from casting a ballot. I mean, you have in the South uh, the 14th and 15th Amendments, one of the great um, puzzles 
is how with the 14th and 15th Amendment, which are guarantees of the vote and guarantees of, of civil rights, you still have Jim Crow. Well, it was, those amendments were enforced by the bayonet until 1877 with Reconstruction. Once the bayonets leave, then practices change. And then there are two court cases, one called uh, Slaughterhouse and the other called Crookshank, which a conservative Supreme Court in the midst of revulsion against Reconstruction in the 1870s, about 1875 or so, uh, first of all, defines U.S. citizenship very narrowly, so that the strength of state citizenship exceeds the strength of U.S. citizenship. And then the second one says uh, that the 14th and 15th Amendments only apply to law, not to actions. So unless you pass a law that people can't vote, uh, you're, you're okay. So you can intimidate people or impose uh, literacy tests, come in and recite the Constitution, that sort of thing, uh, which almost no one could pass, but are only applied to blacks. Uh, so that becomes legal by that Supreme Court, by, by the Crookshanks uh, Supreme Court judgment. Uh, it's only actions that, I mean, it's only laws that are prohibited, not actions. So you have a, an environment from the Supreme Court that allows Jim Crow to proceed. And so you've got to pass civil rights legislation and voter rights legislation in the mid-1960s in order to reaffirm the 14th and 15th Amendments of the Constitution. Okay, with that, I will stop, and then most, most of the second half will spend time with these readings and then talk, talk generally about uh, leadership with King and others. So let's get some coffee and cookies. <laughs> they are going to be showing the film Gandhi at the Keatsall Theater. So those of you who would like to see it uh, will have that available. So it'll be Saturday, May 25th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and, and Shane would like to know about how many of you think that you will be there, the show of hands, so that if we need to add more chairs, we'll be able to do so. Keatsall Theater at Mayflower. At Mayflower, yes. Say the date again. Okay, thank you very much. And now back to the last half of the last course uh, with George Drake and Leadership in Crisis. Thank you, Joanne. And as you know from what I said about that movie, it's well worth seeing. But well. Um, well, I want to spend a little time with these handouts. and. Uh, with a uh, squeeze of time, I won't uh, be going over the I Have a Dream speech. The reason I included that is I think it is an extraordinary example of rhetorical style. Uh, King begins with reference to Abraham Lincoln. In fact, he talks about five score years ago, is the way he opens it. And he's standing in front of the statue of Lincoln uh, at the Lincoln Memorial and it mentions the Emancipation Proclamation and the Constitution. And then he, so this wonderful image he throws out of the canceled check uh, or the promissory note that is not received, redeemed, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. They've been, have been in our society from the beginning and they're still been for a black person a dead letter. And a promissory wrote, no, that must be redeemed. And he moves on to the fact that now is the time. Uh, we can't turn back. This nation can't be turned back. This nation has to confront this most divisive of issues. Uh, and then uh, 
he moves into some examples of uh, discrimination and then ends up with, with, the, with the parts that, that we rem that most of us remember, uh, the sort of ringing uh, movement from Georgia to Mississippi to Alabama, uh, Stone Mountain in Georgia and so on, and let freedom ring. And, and, uh, so and it's pretty typical of his speeches in that kind of context, that he ends with these absolutely soaring use of the English language and repetitiveness, a kind of poetic quality. So it starts out with a very reasoned, historically connected speech. Uh, he acknowledged, at one point he acknowledges white support, white supporters who were there, there are 250,000 people standing in front of him. Probably most of them couldn't hear him. Uh, but of course, it's, it's, we have the re recording, of, I mean, we have it on film and so on, and, and it could be CBS, there, there's some controversy about whether he was put at the end in order not to get television co coverage, but CBS turned off for a while and then came back on when he was uh, focused on his speech, so it was nationally televised. But it is, it's not a long speech, and, but well worth looking at, uh, obviously for what it says, but also for its style. I think it is an extraordinarily uh, example of how to, how to give a public speech that really captures the occasion and motivates people. There are the other two uh, handout, items in the handout are, first of all, a uh, speech that he gave to a religious conference in 1962 uh, called The Ethical Demands for Integration. And uh, I had intended to read and have us look together at a lot of the speech. We'll have not have enough time to do uh, as much as I had hoped. But, uh, it, the reason I've uh, reproduced this speech and, and invite you to read it uh, is that it shows the degree to which he is a theologian and the degree to which he brings Christian theology into his civil rights efforts. Uh, it just, you just can't separate King from his religious beliefs and from his theological education. It's, it just permeates. And of course he's speaking to a a religious group. And we'll see with the letter from a Birmingham jail, which is addressed to pastors, that he also hits the pastors in the weak spot, which is with theology. Uh, there's a lot of theology in it. He, he, he was an excellent theologian. But in his speech, he, what he does is he contrasts um, desegregation, which can be done by law, and then can be enforced by government, so that you can force people not to discriminate. You cannot force them to integrate. Integration is a matter of the soul and the heart and of contact. Now, what he, what he doesn't do in the speech is, uh, I think, as much as he could have, but then he doesn't have the experience. I mean, we, we in, in, in our position today, are in a much better position to understand what happens, or how you how you could possibly move from desegregation? We we live in a desegregated society, uh, and you can get into trouble, a lot of trouble, if you segregate against the law, and the law is enforced. So we're there now, but uh, do we live in an integrated society? It's really interesting to observe Grinnell College. Um, when I was president, uh, we were just sort of holding the line with respect to diversity of the student body. It was reasonably diverse for a school in the middle of Iowa, but we uh, did not have anything close to a critical mass of diversity. We were predominantly in a, group, a, a school of Anglo-Saxon citizens. Nancy's shaking her head, then she was in our admissions office at that time. By the way, when, when I arrived in Grinnell in 1979, we had more students from the New York metropolitan area now there's two things to be said about that. One that is wonderful that Nancy Malley was working in the New York area and producing all these wonderful students. And they, they, they were an important part of the characterization of our student body. They were, you know, New Yorkers in the middle of Iowa. They really had an impact at our college. The other side is quite negative. We should have more than 9% Iowa kids. We're an Iowa school. And we did work on that. We got up to 18% during that period and we hired uh, Dorothy Palmer to do nothing but Iowa admissions, and she was superb. Uh, so we did build it up. 
But uh, anyway, that's the kind of school we work. Today, it's quite different. I think our entering class next year will be 20% of students of color and 15% international. Is that right, Nancy? I think it's more. I think it's more like 26%. 26% students of color, 15% international, many international students, not all students of color. So you can see, you're getting up now into the high 30s. 40% uh, of, of, of what you'd say is a more diverse student body. And it makes a huge difference. People are interacting together. Not that you don't have racial tensions at Grinnell College. And not that there aren't issues. But uh, I don't even notice a black face on campus. I used to really notice, wow, black, wonderful, you know, from the point of view of someone who's trying to work on the issue. But it's just, it's just part of the society. It's part of who we are. Um, and, and that's what you, where you have to get. That's where you move from desegregation to integration. Well, think today of the issue of gays in our society. Now, most of us in this room are of a generation that was homophobic. I was homophobic. I used to talk about the kids who wore yellow on Thursday when I was in high school. All that sort of crap. Um, <laughs> I had to learn not to be homophobic. How did I learn not to be homophobic? I interacted with gay and lesbian students at Grinnell College in important ways. Got to know them, got to like them. Uh, it, it just it changed attitudes. Now, almost all of us now, because people come out, have gay or lesbian friends. And we like them. We aren't repelled by them. We don't, it, it, it's happening in our society. It's that, Notion. I should, I'm, I'm preaching now, I guess. I should be a historian. But as you interact, Amen, brother. Uh, <laughs> as you interact, uh, then uh, most of those things fall apart and you begin to be an integrated group in a society. So we're moving toward integration. But King, in, in this uh, lecture, does a wonderful job of making that contrast saying that the spirit and the heart have to be moved toward uh, integration. We're working on desegregation. We're making gains on desegregation. But the, we've got a long, long ways to go to become an integrated society. And I, I will just read you just a few items from this one, but I, I'm on page 118, the one in, in the left-hand column, and it says, integration, the ultimate goal. I'm going to read the first paragraph. The word segregation represents a system that is prohibiting. It denies the Negro equal access to schools, parks, restaurants, libraries, and the like. Desegregation is eliminated and negative, for it simply removes these legal and social prohibitions. Integration is creative and is therefore more profound and far-reaching than desegregation. Integration is the positive acceptance of desegregation and the welcome participation of Negroes into the total range of human activities. Integration is genuine intergroup interpersonal doing. Desegregation then rightly is only a short range goal. Integration is the ultimate goal of our national community. Thus, as America pursues the important task of respecting the letter of the law, i.e. compliance with desegregation decisions, she must be equally concerned with the spirit of the law committed to the democratic D, dream of integration. And um, just skipping up actually to the first paragraph, de desegregation not enough, I just want to read the last line of that. We must always be aware of the fact that our ultimate goal is integration and that desegregation is only a first step on the road to the good society. Perhaps this is the point at which we should define our terms, etc. Now, also in this speech, King I think does a wonderful job of laying out the fact that this issue of racial justice and races being integrated rather than segregated, moving through desegregation to integration, is the most important issue faced by our society. And th I'm thinking back of, of Don Smith's talk on, on Tocqueville and what Tocqueville recognized as the absolutely most divisive element in democ the democracy of America, slavery, and racial relations. Uh, George Washington, uh, owner of slaves, and part of the constitution-making process where they finessed the issue because we would not have had a country if 
we had dealt with slavery at the beginning. Abraham Lincoln, who in a way resolves it with the destruction of slavery, but who himself did not see the possibility that black and white could live together as free people in our society and therefore promoted colonization of free slaves uh, to King. And uh, this, it's just, it is absolutely pervasive in our society. And I'm going to make a dangerous political statement now. <laughs> we still confront it in the opposition to our president. There are a lot of people who, though he got elected, are determined that he won't be able to do anything. He can get elected, but he can't do anything. Yeah. So I think racism underlies, not all, by any means all, but some of the opposition to our president. It's not spoken because we no longer are in a society where you can speak these things, but they nevertheless exist, I believe. So there's a, another dangerous It'll be interesting. Tommy. It'll be interesting to see the Supreme Court decisions that are coming up in whether or not racial discrimination is no longer a problem. Because hmm. there are two issues that are, be, that are going to be dealt with by the Supreme Court in the next yep. month or few weeks. Tommy Haas's uh, comment is that it would be interesting to see what happens with the Supreme Court in the next few months as they deal with, again, with Racial, racial issues. So, yeah. you know, it, it's with us for for sure. Obviously, we've made tremendous gains. Can you imagine a, a black person being elected back when King was? <laughs> no possibility. And even when and it's happened in our time, most of us are just stunned by the fact that it did happen. So, you know, we're making we're making progress, but it's a slow crawl, and it really underscores how divisive that issue has been for our society. It just has been an overwhelming issue for our society. And in King, we're dealing with the person who most devoted himself, I guess, of anyone in, well, it's hard to say of anyone in history, but certainly anyone in recent history, to uh, achieving racial justice. And, and in this, you know, recognizing that racial justice is one thing, integration and understanding and being one society is quite another, and it's going to take us a while to do that. So I'm going, I'm going to um, move beyond uh, that speech and, and go over and say just a little bit about the last reading you have here, which is not headlined, but you have to look sort of at the top of, of the page to see what it is. It's the letter from Birmingham City Jail. Uh, in, in April of 1963, believe it or not, we've just passed through the 50th anniversary but that, most of us realize how much time has passed. I'm indebted again to Tommy Haas, who, uh, she and Dennis are subscribers to the Christian Century, and uh, appropriately, the Christian Century, in an April issue, uh, commemorated a letter from a Birmingham jail, because, among other things, Christian Century was the first to publish it. So they were in on the ground floor uh, with that event. Now, the, now what, what the, the context for that letter is that um, eight um, Protestant, well, eight, no, not all Protestant by any means, eight Alabama religious leaders, white, had written an open letter to Martin Luther King and to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because they had decided and were in the process of leading integration efforts in Birmingham, Alabama. They very, I mean, they, they identify Birmingham as the, mo as the hardest nut to crack of any of the major cities of the South. So they decided, you know, coolly process of decision making and the organization that they would lead demonstrations, uh, voter rights demonstrations and so on. And it was, there were laws passed in Birmingham against open marching and demonstrations and so on. So they were breaking the law in doing it. And therefore, many, many, many of them ended up in jail. In fact, probably the thing that captured the national attention was when it was a sort of a children's crusade, young kids who went out and marched and ended up being put in jail yeah. as well. Bull Connor and his dogs and his hoses, yeah. uh, which many of us saw on, on the television, that was part of this. And then 
this is in April, by the late summer was when the bombing and the church where the four girls, uh, Sunday school girls were killed. So all of this, it just, it, it's a cockpit. Birmingham becomes a cockpit. And a deliberately created cockpit on the part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so, as not surprisingly happens, religious leaders, white religious leaders, are condemning you know, don't, don't, there's violence, there's disruption, there's a possibility that people are going to get killed. That didn't happen to have, have to happen. It's you folks who are stepping out and creating all of this unrest and discord and indeed uh, chaos in our society. So they wrote an open letter and they, they were two Episcopal bishops, two Methodist bishops, the pastor of the leading Baptist church, White Baptist church, the leader of the Alabama Presbyterian church, Catholic bishop of the diocese that included Birmingham, and a prominent rabbi, uh, the eight who write this open letter. But the newspaper is brought in to King, while well, he's, he's in prison now, uh, in the jail, for having led the demonstration. King is incensed by it, and he writes a response, actually in the margins of the newspaper, the people who put this together are smuggled out and the people who put it together had to sort of piece it together. My guess is that ultimately it got re-edited by, by King, but, and, because it's such a, such a beautiful uh, letter and, and, and well-crafted well letter. Uh, and then it, it never was sent to these eight. It's a letter to them, but not sent. It's published in the Christian century, and then there are at least a million copies of it that circulate around, particularly in, in the churches. So, it's, it, it's, along with the I Have a Dream speech, the most famous document uh, related to King. And uh, again, with, I had quite uh, extensive sections of, that I was going to quote, but I won't, I won't do that. You can read it on your own. But he starts out by uh, answering the charge that you know, they're disrupted. Uh, he's got to answer that charge. That's, that's the primary charge. And he say, it just explains the conditions that black people face. And are they supposed to, to wait? It's, he says this in many, many uh, uh, venues, but time is not neutral. You can use time in a very active way to stop things from happening by saying the time is not right. And again, those of us in this room can remember those things being said. We might even have said it ourselves. It's just not the right time. Well, says King, and this is where he brings in the zeitgeist, um, time is right. Look at what's happened after World War II and all the independence movement. The black people of the world are moved, moving, and we are part of that movement. And we, it isn't quite the same as an independence movement in Africa, but it's part of the same spirit striving for equality and opportunity to determine our own lives and not have them de determined by other people. Um, he, he talks about waiting on time, and, and he says, uh, it has been a tranquilizing th thalidomide. Remember thalidomide? Oh, wow. He's bringing that. <laughs> Relieving the emotional stress for a moment only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. Ill-formed infant, the, th the thalidomide baby. He, he has a ma magnificent capacity to bring in uh, images that are uh, very, 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 very striking. Then uh, he's addressing this to pastors. So over in the next column on page 293, he sort of goes through a uh, litany of great theological minds to these pastors. Uh, these people have said these things, which are supportive, obviously, of King's position. St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Martin Buber, Paul Tillich, uh, you know, he goes on in other, other parts of the, brings up other names in, in, in this letter. Now, um, he talks about the fact that progress never just happens. It has to be driven. You have to make it happen. And therefore, you cannot wait. Um, and without, he says, there are tensions in our society. The tensions are there. We aren't creating them. We are exposing them. We didn't create this black-white tension. You would like to damp it down and pretend it doesn't exist because of your nice relations with your 
maidservant or whatever. Uh, but those tensions are there. You just don't recognize them. We are making them evident and bringing them out. Um, then, uh, let's see, uh, there's a section on page 296 on the myth of time. And uh, then he also, he does one of the things that is being thrown at him now. This is April of 1963, and the Black Power Movement is beginning to raise its head. And he's saying, we did not create the Black Power Movement. And in fact, you better be happy we exist, because we are nonviolent. The Black Power Movement is violent. They're saying we've got to fight fire with fire. You better be thankful we exist because we're pushing nonviolence. Our approach is a nonviolent approach. The Black Power approach is a violent approach. He actually has some good things to say about Black Power, but there's this inevitable uh, direction that, that the Black Power moves, which is in a direction of, of, of violence. Then he, uh, on page 297, toward the end, he talks about extremists. You're accusing us of being extremists. Well, says he, Jesus was an extremist. You know, he, he threw the money changers out of the temple. Paul was an extremist for Christ. Uh, Martin Luther, the Martin Luther, was an extremist, creating the Reformation. Uh, John Bunyan was an extremist. Abraham Lincoln was an extremist. Thomas Jefferson was an extremist. And so he goes through the liter litany of both religious and secular figures who make changes, make things happen. And guess what? They're extremists. So, yeah, we're extremists in that sense. And we better be. Um, then a f finally a section with his disappointment with the white church. And uh, he talks about the white church uh, being a tail light rather than a headlight. Uh, that's over in the middle of 299, and pretty much says it all. But uh, he's very, very, what, what he says essentially is, maybe the white liberals are our biggest problem. At least the segregationists, we know where they stand, what, what they're going to do. But the white liberals who say they're with us and then don't do anything to help us are really a, a kind of fifth column that would undercut our efforts. <coughs> Uh, and, you know, of course, you folks to whom I'm writing this letter are uh, representatives of that white church. So anyway, I, I commend um, the, uh, that to, to uh, your reading uh, when you have the leisure to do so, if you haven't already done it. Um, now, we, we're within uh, five minutes of the time when I must stop because we have some things to do for the sort of end of the year. Uh, of our bucket courses, which, by the way, I think, having attended all of these, has been a terrific. Well, I won't say anything about this lecture, but the, 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 uh, we've had just a tremendous array of, of lectures. I think all of us are getting even more uh, engaged with this process than uh, when we started. So, um, I I think since we have about seven or uh, no, four or five minutes. But the thing to, I'll just mention that King, by 1967, becomes an anti-Vietnam leader. We're aware of that. Um, he sees it as diverting the attention of society. I mean, obviously, in, in, intrinsically, he thinks it's a bad thing. But it's diverting our society's wealth and attention away from the critical. We want to be dealing with civil rights in this country, not messing around in Southeast Asia with somebody else's issue and somebody else's sovereignty. Um, well, why don't, we, why don't I stop and just give us at least a few minutes to talk about King's leadership, but also leadership in general. Uh, for example, uh, with, with King, you wonder if the boycott had not happened in Montgomery, what, what, what would have happened? Would he have become a civil rights leader? Maybe, maybe not. Is it one of those things where does the do the events shape the person or does the person shape the events? Once he's drawn into the movement, I think he's a shaper, no question about it. But uh, it was an event that drew him out. Uh, he was the right person in the right place at the right time, and willing to assume that as his goal in life. Ken, isn't it correct that he has remarkably good fortune? that we have a president who has more control over Congress at that time, Lyndon Johnson, everybody in Congress owed him. So when he wanted to get a law passed, he damn well could do it, no matter what it was. <laughs> so Ken Christensen's comment was that wasn't were we lucky that we had Lyndon Johnson exactly when we had him, because 
He knew where all the bodies, I didn't, didn't use that term, <laughs> where all the bodies were. It's really true, he used that. And he got some absolutely rapid segregationists <laughs> to go along with him, which he had to do because they, you know, we're, we're, we're leading now with the Democratic Party, which whose strength was in the South, right? Yeah. I mean, we've seen this reversal now where there's no strength in the Democratic Party because of that. I mean, they became the, the party of desegregation, and so the South threw them out and now re re elects others, Republicans, uh, and, you know, the solid South. But all those folks were chairs of committees. And they had, they had the seniority and the power, and Lyndon Johnson had to work through that. Was, I mean, we think of an impossible situation now with, with the way that uh, redistricting has been done in the states so that you've got the primaries being more important than the general election because people have created the districts they want uh, to that will re-elect them. And that's a huge problem that we have in our society today. I think it's the biggest problem we've got. But it was equally difficult then with, with uh, Southern committee chairman and so on. Well, one, one <laughs> Joanne's holding up, we really have to stop. But any, one other question or comment, I'm sorry to truncate this part of it, but I'm gonna hold M you MJ, this. MJ. I'm going to hold you to this, George. Remember talking about destiny. King talks a ton about destiny. So in the overall picture of these leaders, do you think that the evolution of events collide with a personality to meet that sort of thing? You could call King being called, that's true. Others are, do you believe in destiny? That was my... Okay, MJ Zimmerman's question, uh, question is, do I believe in destiny? In other words, the, the um, coincidence or the convergence of events and people in leadership. I'm, I, you know, I'm an historian, I can't quite say it's destiny. Uh, either draw me out of the profession, right? Um, but I, what I will say is that I think there's so much potential for leadership in our society that the events will call forth people uh, for the, whether they'll succeed or not, they will, when there are plenty of examples where it hasn't, but it does call forth leaders. Uh, that's, we're so different as human beings. Uh, and there's so much flux and flow in human history and in events that I do believe that the, they're almost, not almost, I can't say quite certainly, but almost inevitably will be leadership available to respond to the events as they unfold. So that's my, we, I have to stop uh, because we do have some business to do out here. So thank you very much. He did it again, didn't he? Yeah. And of course, we have a token of thanks for you, a card. And of course, I had to write a poem. <laughs> the card has a, what a nice picture of all these noble gentlemen we've been studying. And on the back, are you familiar with that piece of paper that you signed and there was nothing there? But now he has this uh, little memento from us. And I'll read you a poem. I have to write a poem. Well, I'm glad you did. I love your poems. <laughs> Why we love George. <laughs> when we were kids, we had to take a U.S. history course. We stuck it out until the end, but not without remorse. As we were bored up to our teeth, we tried to stay awake. We knew we had to know those dates for test on test to take. We doodled, squirmed, and wrote some notes to others in the class in hopes the hour would hurry up so we could leave en masse. Now here we are in class again. Is this self-flagellation? <laughs> are we to struggle once again dry facts about our nation? How nice it was to be surprised to find out what a treat a U.S. history course could be and fun for the love of Pete. <laughs> Where were you, George, when we were for those tests we had to pass? Where were you when we had no choice but to sit here on our chairs? <laughs>
You made these five men come alive and seem like they were real. The way you wove in history had oh so much appeal. We are all grateful for no tests, no papers to be written, but you can rest assured that now with history we are smitten. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you, you should, of course, thank you, George. Uh, this is the end of the fourth year of the bucket courses. And when we started this out, Burl Klotfelter was our first speaker, the professor, and he said if we had 12 people, yeah, that would be fine for him. Well, our planning committee at the time thought we might be able to come up with 20 people. As it happened, we had 43, and it has grown ever since until now we have to put a limit on the number we can have registered at 90. So we appreciate your support, and we're glad to know that you are enjoying these bucket courses as much as our planning committee enjoys putting them on. Believe it or not, we have 20 people who attended, who, who have registered for each bucket course since last fall of September. And we are honoring them with a little bucket that says Bucketeers. We're the new Bucketeers for this year. Bucketeers 2012-2013. And each little bucket has a coupon for a free bucket course that can be used anytime in the future. Uh, Jim Arns is going to read the names of the bucketeers for this year and as you read your name please raise your hand and one of the planning committee will uh, give you your bucket jim well we sifted all the records and the registrations and we came up with these names joanne britton Carol Klotfelder, and Mary Lou Klotfelder, Sue Drake, Irene Engelman, Dave Ferguson, Betty Ann Francis, Tommy Haas, Mark Hyman, okay. uh, Susan McIntyre, Carol Nielsen, Gordon Packard behind the camera. Karen Packer, Lori Rackstraw, She's not here. Uh, Monty Rudenius, and Suzanne Rudenius, Betty Weeks, and Dick Weeks, Bob Weimer, who's hiding in the hallway there, and Merrill Zirkel. We thank you so much for coming. We would like to ask that all of you new bucketeers come to the front of the classroom after we're dismissed this morning so that we can take your picture. Uh, also, if the planning committee would stay for a minute, uh, we appreciate that too. Well, this is the last course for this uh, season uh, on June 12th. The ACES courses will begin on Wednesday morning, same time, same place. So we look forward to seeing you for those. And then the bucket courses will resume again September 11th, uh, this coming fall. And you will see the publicity come out for that in late August. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. 
thank you for coming to the bucket courses today and the whole season and have a lovely summer we'll see you in september <laughs>